to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Zorin, my house is a pop culture museum Gavoyich, and today we're looking at The Collection, the 2012 sequel to The Collector. While the $3 million original did well enough in theaters, it really found its audience on home video. Co-writers Patrick Melton and Marcus Dunstan were writing Saw 3D when producers asked them to make a follow-up with triple the budget. They agreed and approached the sequel with Aliens as their guiding light. First Deep Rising, now this? I need to branch out what I'm watching. Well... No! Director Mark Dunstan wanted the collection to work even for viewers who didn't know there was a first film. The result is a bigger, bloodier movie, with some action in its horror, and a little horror in its action. We see Ark in return, trying to find asylum by locating a rich guy's daughter who's been recently collected. To save her, he and a group of mercenaries have to invade the collector's home base of horrors. Personally, the collection failed to create as much of a connection with me as the first film. The underdeveloped mercenaries are just collectible cannon fodder amidst a bunch of blurry, shaky cam action. Plus the traps still don't make any goddamn sense! But I respect the hell out of director Dunstan. The man is a true professional and he created a fun atmosphere on set. It's just a fantastic set to be around. The minute you walk on set, he greets you with a hug. Plus, there are some amazing kills. Brought to glorious life by a few Walking Dead crew members they snagged on hiatus between the first two seasons. And let me tell you, they were invaluable because these kills can get gnarly. But you can make sure that you're not bothering the more squeamish amongst you with the help of today's sponsor, Raycon. Why, just yesterday, I was doing one last watch through the movie and thanks to my Raycons, I was able to make sure I wasn't disturbing a soul. Oh, yeah, oh, 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 uh, hey, Assistant Fiona. Oh, I'm sorry, were you trying to get my attention? I had these in noise isolation mode. Oh, totally fine. I didn't want to disturb your flow or anything. Can you just maybe turn down the shouting? Oh, damn, I'm sorry. That wasn't very awareness mode of me. Sure, so you'll... Actually, tell you what, why don't I give you my second pair? That way, if I'm being too loud, I won't disturb you. You have two? Yeah, since Raycons cost half the price of comparable earbuds, I was able to get myself a pair and a spare for less than I would have spent on the big name competitors. And you know what? You can keep those. It's a business expense anyway. Don't tell James. What was that? Nothing! Anyway, with eight hours of playtime on one charge, you'll be able to go all day without ever noticing me. And next time, if you need me, just call. You can make use of their crystal clear call quality. I will absolutely do that. Thanks, Warren. Give you the Raycons? Yep. You can stock up on your own Raycons at the link in the description, or go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off your Raycon order. Will this tour through the collector's collection be worth the price of admission? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins with a flashback. Elena Peters and her dad coming home from her mom's funeral. Christopher McDonald plays the papa, who promises his daughter he'll always look after her. Promise? I promise. Ooh, looks like your fatal instincts were a little off, Kelbo. The car crashes us right into the opening credits, accompanied by a Nine Inch Nailsy song that says, I want to title card. You like these animals. And in case you need a reminder of who the collector is, this movie's got gotcha. you. The assailant entraps his victims in homes, businesses, and workplaces. He then kills them. Well, except for the ones he keeps for his collection, like the world's kindest burglar, Arkin. Who's got a little heart of gold? You do. We're in present day now with a grown up Elena Peters who still deals with ear damage from the accident. That means she needs a hearing aid to listen to her D bag boyfriend Brian's obvious bullshit. I'm not gonna be able to make it tonight, babe. Uh, I gotta work so close. Luckily, her best friend Missy offers to take her out and raise her spirits. When she sneaks past her dad, old Shooter McSnorin, she's free to hit the club with Missy and Missy's horny brother Josh. Not that Josh. The underground rave they go to is a Frankie Lee wild time. I mean, they have everything garage door openers, Malort mug drunk focus pullers, oh, and cheating scumbags named Brian. Damn it, this is Jeff cheating on Kelly at the attic all over again. And who's that above them all? Why, it's the Phantom of the Garage Rave who's there, biding his time. Yes, Elena, my angel of sadness, cry, yes, cry for me! Damn it! 
Quick crate, you ruined my rhythm. A Toulon trunk distracts her and she unlocks it, hoping to find some Puppet Master kill counts. But instead, she just finds Arkin and Van Helsing's crossbow in the air conditioning system. And yes, I rewatched Van Helsing because you asked me to, and it's fine. CGI still is garbage. The shot wakes up a Michael Bay transformer in the walls, ultimately triggering a steam-powered combine harvester above the party. Damn, I guess this place really does have everything. Only Brian notices the stabby thresher spinning on the dance floor. Oh, whoa. But before anyone can call 911, Brian makes like a man without a hat and leaves his friends behind. Because if your friends just dance and go for romance, then they're going on the count. This is definitely the film's most iconic scene and was inspired by a mandate from the financiers who wanted a younger, sexier cast. Melton and Dunstan only had one question. So we said, well, uh, how long do they have to live? And they're like, no, we don't care. Like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> this machine puts an end to the last party in Zion, turning this rave into a grave. But a few party monsters get special attention, like little bro Josh, the girl he was macking on, and the DJ who gets tossed onto this Candyman wall. Woo, this puts that blood raven blade to shame. Now you'd think that this would be a pain in the ass to count. Yeah, I can believe it. But thankfully, director Marcus Dunstan did our job for us. We had to eviscerate 236 people. Since we see the mass slaughter and we're given a specific number, we can put 236 people on the count. Please keep giving us exact figures, horror filmmakers. We're begging you. Although it kind of does put Josh out of a job. The special effects team was led by David Fletcher, a man whose previous credits are too numerous to list. The Combine was basically an erector set made of pieces cut by water jets and soldered together. It weighs approximately 1,500 pounds. It's 26 feet across. It's a variable speed motor, so it can travel at whatever speed we choose to have it travel at. Oh, so that could actually kill someone. The blades are all rubber. We do have real blades for it but uh, we, there was never a requirement for us to use them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Production had 55 gallons of fake blood for the scene and still ran out. They used sprayers and air mortars to launch blood and guts on set, then shot exploding blood bags on green screen to sweeten the carnage cake. And I don't know how anyone could not have fun doing this. And they are just hosing us down, just head to toe, just all red. And I look up and I see one of my bosses and he's just shaking his head and mouthing, I'm sorry. And that was stunt performer Elizabeth Davidovich, who I have a personal connection with since she's the sister of my good friend, Joanna Davidovich, who animated the Graboid in the Ballad of Bird Gummer. This was one of her first features as a stunt performer and she had a blast because they kept using her over and over again. If there's a female flying through the air, that's me. Elena leaves Arkin to undo his own anklet and find out what all those lasagna noises in the dark are about. She witnesses some non-Danny Trejo machete kills, including one that actually looks like the blood spray killed her. That machete did shit. Well, in any case, Brian the dick boyfriend has officially been unfriended. Meanwhile, Missy missed the mulchy massacre, only to find herself in a compacting cube cage. Unreal. Elena tells the Zeta Beta Zeta pledge to fight back. No, 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 push up, stupid. But Missy loses to the machinery and is killed along with 16 other XX party guests. Guess I better tell the law his ex is dead. Yeah, hey, the law, Jenny Matrix is dead. Zorin, that's a character I played on a web series. Please stop calling me. <laughs> Elena runs and finds seven more machete victims that somehow piled up in the two minutes she was gone. You're all idiots, you deserve to die. She I asks Arkin for help, but then the collector sneaks up behind her sounding like a gremlin. <laughs> Ooh, Arkin doesn't like midnight deadlines, so he grabs Brian's fresh corpse and uses it as a crash pad to safety. Good job, Brian. That's literally the nicest thing you did in the entire movie. This jump was done off a platform created 16 feet off the ground and was performed by the awesomely named stunt double, Bonsai Vitali. It was like 25 degrees, the wind was howling, and I was just barefooted. I wasn't jumping 16 feet down. There's something wrong with those guys that they want to do that stuff. And I thought I had a cool name. I don't. Arkin Rigsity resets his arm and runs free. Hey man, aren't you gonna leave a note for Ash about his car? Meanwhile, Elena becomes the collector's latest Redbox rental. 
Careful, man. There's a daily fee if you don't return her on time. That's how they get you. At the hospital, they re-reset Arkin's arm, and he briefly talks to his wife. So, honey, do you, do you still need that money for those loan sharks? Oh, no, you're a different actress. <laughs> I'm sorry, my bad. We'll just ignore that plotline. Say hi to my daughter for me. The movie doesn't need her anyway. It's got this cop. I'm not a cop. Yeah, that's what a cop would say. Well, he's actually not a cop. This is Lucello, the guy Mr. Peters pays to eat pieces of shit like the collector for breakfast. And son of a beacher, he's played by one of my favorites, Lee Turgeson, previously seen on the kill count in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. Lucello proposes a deal that sounds awfully familiar. I've assembled a team and we are gonna find him and kill him. If Argan helps them find Elena and the collector, he'll get a clean slate, or maybe some money. I, who cares, he's, he's going. Argan uses the Yacha language cuts he made on his arm when he was kidnapped to retrace the drive back to the collector's hideout. It's at the long abandoned Hotel Argento, which looks pretty suspicious to me. In a neat cross-cutting sequence, we see Arkin pick his way in, as Elena picks her way out of captivity. This scene shows how she's not your typical helpless horror heroine. She learns to to save herself, which is, is really cool, and um, I never had to show my tits. Always a plus. Elena quickly counts two CGC 1.5 grade collectibles hanging in the background. She also finds another box making weird noises, and since the last one only ruined her life a little bit, she goes for the best two out of three. Oh, good, it turns out it's just rigor mortis. Thank goodness. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry for your loss. The collector comes back to add one more body to the count that offends YouTube's violence and nudity sensibilities, before checking on his arachnophobia buddies. Ooh, you wanna make some new friends, Elena? The filmmakers were at the end of their booby-trapped rope trying to cast Elena when they spotted Emma Fitzpatrick in The Social Network. She brings a believable toughness to the role, even if she had some fears on set. The scene originally called for real spiders to crawl all over her, but just the thought of it made her cry for five hours. To keep her from dehydrating further, they switched to comp spiders, but she still shook when Dunstan directed The Invisible Kind. Luckily for her, a burglar alarm distracts the collector before the eight-legged freaks get any freakier. Unluckily for Arkin, though, Lucello violates the Ripley rule and forces him inside. It's the same deal, Arkin. I'll kill the guy, but you gotta help us find Elena. Seems like Lucello might be closer to Elena than her father is. And is the reason she survived the accident. Although I give credit to that goatee. The command dodos leave a guy named Lynn to guard the door, then head inside as the collector laces up for the big game. Poster shot! The Collector's Cave was brought to life by Walking Dead production designer Graham Grace Walker. They didn't have the budget to build a full set, so they literally went old school with an old school in Atlanta. The medical room was built in the school's kitchen with set decoration by Graham's wife, Kristen Donaldson Walker. Together, they added an amazing level of detail to the film. They were two selfless, wildly dedicated artists that were really responsible for telling the story of who our villain was. As Elena struggles to find a diehard joke that hasn't already been made, Lynn the doorman gets a surprise hug from the collector, who sounds like a cougar for some reason. The Sulaco rejects are too busy getting jump scared to notice. This blurry cuckoo nester tussles and tumbles till a merc named Paz gives it a full frontal lobotomy. What the fuck was that? One of the Joker's homicidal art pieces, I think? Turns out the collector loves degrading the value of his human collectibles, driving them insane with torture and hard drugs, making them... Like a zombie. He's not a zombie, he's just a person. But they scream like idiots and act like zombies, so I'm gonna call them Screamies. They find a pile of parts that won't go on the count since we never met these kibble and bits. And honestly, it's impossible to get a real number out of them anyway. But don't worry, we can add this scream bee that Lucello quickly dispatches. Also played by Elizabeth Davidovich in her first squib stunt. That's me. That was this shoulder. <laughs> oh, look. That's Oh, I still have a band-aid. Turns out Elizabeth was actually an Eliza witch, alerting a nearby scream horde. Fast cuts and blurry close-ups make this difficult to count. So what do you say, Josh? Oh, what, now you need me? The director didn't give you a number? Whatever, it's seven, enjoy. Cool, we'll add seven sassy scream bees to the count. The anti-collector task force retreats as Elena discovers another trunk she just has to open. Really? Inside the LA Lakers trunk, she finds a Harley Quinn personator named Abby, who's so traumatized by the masked magician she doesn't even want to escape. Good thing the commandos have no such hesitation, following bloody footprints into a room full of crates. They find a half-naked man who speaks only in riddles. I didn't make it. What didn't you make? The collection. They don't ask for a lifeline in time, and the bomb strapped to his neck gets his final answer all over them. The explosion somehow triggers a spike trap, 
and these three random spikes hit non-Dr. Dre, killing him and leaving some blood for a La Magra resurrection ritual. With the group distracted by the kill count graphic, Arkin's able to slip away. Not Ali Portman and Dolly Dearest stick together to avoid confusingly stupid trap mashups. And when something sets off Elena's hearing aid, it reveals Abby as a raging autist. You have a hearing aid. You're not strong enough. You're at a disadvantage. Oh yeah? Tell that to Reagan! The hall monitor breaks it up and chases Elena into the ceiling. And only one man is well-versed enough in the collector's game to save her now! Well, oh, never mind. Arkin, what happened to you? Arkin hears a merc named Wally looking for him. He's played by Andre Royo, best known for The Wire. The only place to hide is a laundry chute, leading to the Frankenhooker parts storage pile. So Arkin somehow hangs there with his broken cast arm, before eventually falling into the show bits and piece us play pit. Arkin works the shaft and climaxes by going full McLean. The collexpert heads to a human centipede wing, adding a few trophy kills to the count. As usual, we're only gonna count the ones with meat on their bones. And going by the torso, that gives us four Ripley rejects to add. Shake me, shake me. These meat trophies were built by makeup effects designer Gary Tunnicliffe and his team. And boy, was it a lot of work. I think he maybe took an hour off to sleep on New Year's Eve. Tunnicliffe also fully sculpted some bodies seen earlier and designed the collector's mask. It's actually very comfortable to wear. Tunnicliffe's work has been seen on this show before in Halloween 6 and Resurrection, as well as Hellraiser Bloodline. Oh, and all those later Hellraisers that James still hasn't covered. I'll get to that! Not everyone is dead in this Body Works exhibit, though, as Arkin finds a woman nailed to the wall by her hands, elbows, knees, not toes, but who knows? The collector doesn't like when Art speaks to him, so he just up and slits her throat, which is apparently all he came in here to do. I don't get you, man. Elena stumbles into a less impressive hall of bear traps when compared to the first film. Yes, it's me again. I'm going to need some more bear traps. Uh, only three this time, so that's not a crime, right? Right? Hmm? Those are sirens. She proves she's better than Leon Kennedy, easily passing the Buckner bear traps and heads into the collector's main office, just as Arkin breaks into the mummy maze at Halloween Horror Nights. He's found by the commandos who knock him down and rough him up, but joke's on them, since only Arkin notices the collector's gone fishing, Pesci Glover style. He hooks himself 170 pound Wally. And, you know, I mean, it makes sense. You go fishing, you see bubbles. The collector swings in like Errol Flynn and sends Paz on a little upside down roller coaster ride. Well, actually looks pretty fun and badass. But just as fast, the collector reverses the film back up into the rafters. The original collector's actor, Juan Fernandez, is replaced here by stunt performer Randall Archer, likely due to the sequel's more action-y requirements. Or maybe Fernandez just didn't want to be lonely on set. Nobody wants to talk to me. Archer does a great job, but I do miss the creepy slenderness of Fernandez. But hey, it's kind of like a hotter versus cursinger Jason, to each their own. Abby shows up and says she knows where Elena is, so she, Lucello, and Arkin soldier on through the Mannequin Reboot's casting couch auditions. They're following Paz's screams, not knowing that they're coming from a speaker. So it's Elena who finds the mercenary first in a dolphin's nightmare net. Lucello only manages to find... Oh God, no, it's a... a... I'm sorry, who is that again? Actually, can you give me a little help, writer Jeremy? Oh, him? That's the button man Lynn, the one who caught the Harlem sunset from the park with the pearlescent papers. That did not help at all. Lynn was killed earlier and is doubly done in by a bunch of ba -bombs, both regular and glitter. Arkin says Van Damme the seven years bad luck and makes them a Belgian exit. Once Lucello power slides in, they turn a single quarter and find Elena and Paz. Well, that was super easy, barely an inconvenience. <laughs> oh, I'm being sued by Ryan George. The reunion shows us there's nothing stronger than the bond between a girl and her father's employee who dragged her from a burning car once. But hey, now Elena's trapped in an equally bad situation, and to get them out of it, Harkin shoots a homeless guy. Some of it's straight up wish fulfillment, like taking a cheap shot at a hobo near a burning barrel, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh... <laughs> Uncomfortable laughter. Arkin reasons the gunshot will bring cops around. I mean, honestly, this place is pretty desolate. I don't think it's it. And there they are! Okay, 30 seconds later. Woo, that's a good response time. Arkin shows the cops where they are with a felonious salutation, which is right around the time Abby reveals that her favorite city is Stockholm. He likes me, you know. Paz thinks Sweden is overrated, so she knocks Abby onto the count with another convoluted trap, triggered by three nails and a closing track by Iron Maiden. 
Hallowed be thy name, dear Abby. The Collector's Killexa sets the mood for the premiere of his deadliest trap yet. A gun and two dogs! He's able to clip Lucello and put down his own dog after Arkin stabs it in the neck. Why does this man hate dogs? He doesn't even hit anything else. I guess that's why he sticks to the mousetrap crap. The Collector snatches Elena again, leaving the rest of the gang to wonder, who the fuck closed those doors? But Lucello is more concerned with the boo-boo button he's landed on, because it looks like Vakla is gonna get him eventually. So he tells Arkin, I love you, man. And Arkin says thanks by going to rescue Elena. I'm going crazy at the collector's home. Sculptures made out of bone I can explode, get shot, or just cry yeah. There's so many ways that I could die I can shoot a hobo or get killed by the claw Ooh. I can stab a screamy a doggy in the trial Going crazy in the collector's home <laughs> Maybe he'll collect me Hey kids, come to the collector's home today and you can get a free video rental from Redbox Late fees still apply upon inevitable death they ditch the dead weights and again find Elena, who gives them an Akbarian warning. <laughs> Just like in the first film, Arkin skips the sticks and stones. What kind of pussy are you? But his taunting doesn't stop the collector from leaving and lighting this ridiculously long Mission Impossible fuse. Da, 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 da. Da, da. Collector! Realizing they can't escape, Arkin volunteers to turn into a bootleg Mr. Fantastic. I need you to step on my form. And it's Elena's bootleg that allows him to stretch his arm through the bars. After they're free, Paz resets the arm, but come on, that thing's just gotta be oatmeal by now. As the Collector moves on to collecting insurance money, the survivors lower themselves to the ground floor gallery to escape. They get there right as the building goes boom! And when it came to this explosion, it was no easy task. Two months of prep, but somehow he did it in two weeks. Production pumped propane, 2,000 gallons of propane, into the building and then used Nephilim bombs to ignite it. Not Nephilim, the biblical giants that would be better suited if this was a flood scene. Before they can exit through the museum gift shop, the collector cuts in with a double shoulder stab to Paz. But there's no way that, th I'm sorry, what? A kill graphic? Are you serious? Two shoulder stabs wouldn't kill anyone. Come on, Dunstan, you need to check in with reality. The Collector doesn't care that Arkin's arm bones are applesauce, and he shows him his insect collection the hard way. Oh, it's not looking good. If only something disgusting could distract him. Oh, come on! The dog capitation heralds Lucello's return, who's been carting around this Paulus patroller's carcass like a weirdo. The bodyguard borrows Paz's neck knife and takes the collector's head on, mano a cello. Well, it's a shame he's no Brodsky and really sucks at knife fighting. He must just be missing all his quick time events. He manages to slice up a collectabelly though, just before the killer shows him how it's really done. And this is the last time we see Lucello alive, and body bags at the end confirm that he didn't make it. Oh, come on, Gary, Wyatt, can you get Lisa to bring Chet back? Please? Arkin tags in and gets in some good shots, but receives a Richie slip for his troubles. Elena, meanwhile, wants out of this movie and turns into a manic pixie scream girl. It alerts the firefighters outside to their location as Arkin pulls a phasma, dumping the collector down the limdry chute. Arkin must sweat kerosene as he's able to light part of his tank top on fire tossing it down the chute and turning the Midnight Man into the Mid-Ignited Man. Arkin makes his way to the exit, but is blocked by a burning beam. And this burning finale was a challenge to film since it had to use real fire on a studio stage. We had to build a trophy room so it wouldn't burn down. In order to not set off the sprinkler system and also, you know, not kill anyone, they set up a series of fire bars that were meticulously numbered and fed into a valve control system, which could be turned off and on at will. So Marcus, all he had to do was pick which walls that he wanted to be on fire at that time and it would happen. Arkin's finally ready to exit this franchise, but Elena ain't doing part three alone. So she breaks the glass on the Cronenbergian creations, extinguishing a path for Arkin to get through. She's able to do what he couldn't do at the beginning of the movie and save him. Hooray! Trauma blankets for everyone! Oh, and a rich papa for you, Elena! Good job, Goose. You get paid for that second day of work. All that's found of the Collector is his mask, meaning he was able to make it out alive. And I'm gonna note, since he made it out, maybe he took some of his Screamby pets with him, since there's no way of knowing 
how many were left in the building, and if they perished in the fire. Argan decides to track down every bug-type poke person in a 200-mile radius, until he finds the right one in a quaint four-bedroom two-bath. Oh, nice! Is there an HOA on this? Because I'm, I'm interested in putting in a bit. Inside the collector's non-owl house, we hear some backstory for the character on the radio. Turns out his dad was an entomologist who went crazy from ingesting taxidermy chemicals. Slaughtered his whole family and sat them at the Thanksgiving table. Well, not, well, not the whole family. I believe the little boy. Arkin confronts the man who is a completely different ethnicity than the exterminator in the first film, and we get the collector's one and only line. Are you here to kill me? Nope, he's here to collect your ass! And the movie ends with Arkin violently shoving the collector into a trunk prison of his own. Did this collection inception give us a high kill reception? Let's find out and get to the numbers. <laughs> ah, damn it. James, are you in here again? Ugh. Oh, it's empty. <laughs> Why? Stop! <laughs> Solid. But wait! Who's gonna do the numbers? Uh, oh, wait, well, oh, okay. Actually, this is good right here. All right, uh, 287 people died in the collection. Of those, 32 were men, 43 were women, and 212 were two mints to tell, giving us a pie chart as gray as the interior of this trunk. With a runtime of 82 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 16.9 seconds making this the fifth highest kill count and my third entry into the top 10. <laughs> Can you wheel me to the bathroom now? I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to- Oh, come on, you know it's the rave scene. Why even pretend? Seriously, you can't John Deere an entire nightclub and not go home with the gold. Plus, we're not counting John Wick, so this is the closest you'll get to the Red Circle Club. Dull machete for lamest kill goes to Lucello, who doesn't even get to say goodbye. Killed off screen by some desperate house knives. Boo! And that's the collection. Dunstan and Melton actually started filming a third movie called The Collected in 2019. They had Josh Stewart and Emma Fitzpatrick returning, and Tom Atkins was signed on to play Arkin's father. But in a bizarre twist, the producers shut the set down eight days into the shoot, and then stole all the filmed footage, bringing an end to any current chance for a threequel. Next week, I've got a special video just for Tremors Fest, and then in two weeks, I'll continue my guest hosting duties with the much requested Critters franchise! Fuck yeah! I'm excited too, buddy. But until then, I'm a man who's never had a cup of coffee in his life, and this has been the kill count. Oh, and we're done. Okay, let me have that flannel. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take a moment and thank uh, River Lev Studios, who did the collector mask that is on set, and then the one that uh, Ben was wearing was done by Nightmare Fuel Studios. Thank you so much. Those things are just horrifying, absolutely horrifying things. Thank you, Ben, for being the collector, because that mask probably wasn't super comfortable. It was, because Nightmare Fuel Studios does good work, but sometimes masks can be a little claustrophobic. Hopefully you've been tuning into the Patreon. We still got more stuff there. I've got fun videos coming out for the channel. I've got a Tremors video coming out where I was at Tremors Fest. Amazing. I did get an interview with Michael Gross. Oh, and I forgot, in case anyone was curious what my tattoos are, these were drawn on by Fiona. I've got the uh, what, why, and how, because I always ask that about the collector's work. And then over here, I've got Bixby! And yes, just want to also thank uh, executive assistant Fiona, who did set deck here and everything. And I don't know if you can see it, but there is so much razor wire that she put all over this. Don't listen to me anymore. Why don't you just go out and be good people?